jump into our Torah portion. Oh my goodness, what's today's Torah portion called? Yitro, and in English it is Jethro. Exactly. This is the story about the um, Moses uh, meeting up uh, again back at Mount Sinai. This is where earlier Moses had met the Lord at the burning bush, remember? Now he's bringing Egypt, uh, uh, God's coming down in fire at the very first Shabbat after they exited. And here we find out this is when they receive uh, the 10 words, so to speak. So I want to start with, though, the very last verses of last week's Torah portion so we can pick it up knowing what we were closing with last week. In Exodus 17, 8 through 11, look what happens. Then came Amalek, and he fought with Israel in Rephidim. Moses said to Joshua, choose out men, go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hands. So saw Joshua did as Moses said. And they fought with Amalek, and Moses, Aaron, and Ur went up to the top of the hill. And it says it came to pass, and Moses held up his rod, Israel prevailed, and when he let down his rod, Amalek prevailed. Amalek was the very first nation to attack Israel when they came out of the promised land. Now, let me ask you something. How many of you have ever moved to a different state? Everybody has. When you're trying to decide if you're going to move to a different state, what goes through your mind to decide if you want to go to that state? I mean, some might think, oh, do they have state taxes? You know, they might be thinking about money. Other people think about, am I going to make any friends there? I wonder if the people, you know, some might even go, is it a Democrat or Republican state? Or they might even go, are, are, are there kind people there or are they mean people, right? That's one of the things you want to, you know, think about as you're going. What kind of crime is in that city? Is that, you know, is there a lot of crime in this location? Not crime, uh, different things. Well, think about this for a minute. Israel's been in Egypt for 215 years. They're now moving out of the country. Their whole world has been Egypt for 215 years. They have no idea who they're going to encounter in this new area. Are you following me? One of the things you're going to be wondering about is I wonder if the people are friendly or not friendly? Who, who, what kind of people are we going to encounter? Now think about this. They'd been in Egypt for 215 years. Israel had no land to fight over. They had no fortune to fight over. Why did Amalek attack Israel? Baseless hatred baseless, just like that's why the temple was destroyed. They said it was baseless hatred. There is no reason for Amalek to go and attack Israel from behind the elderly, the children, the ones that are sick or whatever, but that's what they did. That is the spirit of Amalek. It is baseless hatred. Basically, they are just evil. In this world, you have people that are basically good, and you have people that are basically evil, and you got a lot of in-between. But we need to understand Amalek is purely evil. That's what it is. It is evil. <clears throat> so we see in uh, life, there are people who are good and others who are evil. And what's amazing, sometimes you can't put it just on the leaders, not all the time, we even see right now cheering on both sides of the Israel-Palestinian conflict. You see a whole bunch of people all throughout the United States and around the world. Some are cheering for the people who have murdered babies and women. Uh, I, I mean, that's insane. How could people be cheering for something like that? Well, <clears throat> The other thing that I want to point out, the Jews in Egypt knew of no other world. They, they didn't know anything. I'll never forget when I was young, and, and I know I've shared this story before, but some people might be hearing it for the first time. And I'll make it real short. 
we were uh, so poor when we grew up because my dad was in a real bad car accident, was in the hospital for two years, he couldn't work. Uh, my mom had nine kids under the age of 13, no twins. She's only 30 years old with nine kids under the age of 13. And so dad can't work. He's in the hospital for two years from the car wreck. Mom's 30 with nine kids, clear down to a newborn, to me a year and a half. She can't work. And the guy had no insurance that uh, was responsible for my dad's car wreck. And so we grew up with nothing. My uh, sister, when she was in fifth grade, uh, she had to wear boys' dress shoes because that's all was in the box. We lived off for years people bringing to our house boxes with donated material. And that's how we survived. They bring food. I mean, we had no money. And so, but for me, I thought everybody, I'm, you know, I'm one and a half, you know, and as I'm growing up to I'm about five, we're still living off donations of boxes of material. And I thought everybody got a box. I literally thought the entire world, everyone had people drop boxes off because that's what I knew. Well, this is the same thing. This is all that Israel knows is slavery in Egypt. They have no idea what they're about to get into. And so uh, let's start with our Torah portion. Here, I think this is fascinating. We just read of an encounter of Amalek and they're thinking, wow, this new place we're going is full of evil. But the very next story is an encounter with Jethro, who loves God, who wants to support them, who wants to be grafted into Israel. So there's two encounters. And I think a lot of times in life when we get saved and we come out of Egypt, we're going to encounter two different sides and we have to choose and also realize that God is for us. Now look at Exodus 18, 1, when Yitro, uh, it says, oh, let me see here. And I think what's interesting, too, I want to mention, here they have an encounter with Amalek. Then they have an encounter with a friendly nation led by Yethro, and then they encounter God. So you have an evil encounter, a good encounter, and then an encounter with God. And that's kind of like God wants to see, just like the tree of good and evil. There are people that are good and are evil. And then it says, Yethro the priest. Now, I want you to know that the word, what's the, anyone know the Hebrew word here for priest? Cohen. But did you know Cohen doesn't always mean priest? Cohen can mean something else. As a matter of fact, if you look at your notes in 2 Samuel 8, verse 18, it talks about David's sons were chief rulers, and the word for rulers is Cohen. So Cohen doesn't have to mean a priest. And I don't think, I mean, Yethro may have been a priest, but the main thing, he was one of the rulers. He was one of the chiefs, just so you know that. <clears throat> And so we see uh, the ruler of Midian, who was Moses' father-in-law. He heard of all that God had done for Moses and for Israel as people, and that the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt. So what do we see here? We see Jew and Gentile coming together. From the very beginning, when they're leaving Egypt, there are a mixed multitude of Gentiles coming with them. When they enter Israel, there are Gentiles, again, coming and joining with them. Now, who remembers who the Midianites were? Where did the Midianites come from? Midianite, if you make a note, Genesis 25, 2, we see that they were Abraham's son also. They were Abraham's son from Keturah. Okay, so these guys are like first cousins again. We have to realize this. And Jethro or Yethro was a Midianite. All right. Now, uh, it says Exodus 18, 12, Yethro, Moses' father-in-law, he even made a burnt offering to God. And then Aaron came with the chiefs of Israel and they had a meal with Moses' father-in-law before God. So we see here his name is Yethro. And listen to the advice. And I think this is amazing. Moses is humble enough to listen to, to a non-Jew as far as the direction he should go. He wasn't proudful. He wasn't arrogant. Yeah, I'm leading, you know, three million people and I had all these miracles happen and you're trying to tell me what to do. No, we always have to have the attitude and be humble and listen to what others have to say. And it's especially your father-in-law. Sometimes the last person you want to listen to is your mother-in-law or your father-in-law. 
<clears throat> but he says, listen to my voice in verse 19 through 21. And he says, I'm going to give you counsel and God will be with you. Stand before God for the people so that you can bring all the difficulties to God and teach them his statutes and laws. Show them the way that they must walk and the work they must do. Moreover, though, he says, select from all the people, able men, and look at what is required of the able men. They fear God, they're men of truth, and they hate covetousness. Does that sound like any of our politicians? Do they fear God? Do they hate covetousness? Are they men of truth? Uh, part of our problems is we don't have good rulers. And it says, place such over them who are rulers of thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. Okay, well, look at Psalms 1, verse 1 and 2. It says, blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners or sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in what? The Torah. That, the Torah. We're supposed to delight in Torah. So many people think Torah is just legalism. No. And then it says, how many believe we should meditate and pray? Well, this says in his Torah, he meditates day and night. So let's go back to Exodus 18, 23 and 24. Yethro says, if you do this thing, and God commands you. So he's not saying, look, you do what I say. He's saying only this is my suggestion. And if God commands you, then do it. Okay. And then you'll be able to endure and all these people will go to their place in peace. So Moses heeded the voice of his father-in-law and did all that he said. I think that says a lot about both people. Okay. Exodus 19, one through three. This is kind of hilarious in one sense. And I'll explain why here in a minute. It was on the third new moon after the people of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt or the third month. And on that day, they came into the wilderness of Sinai. Almost everything in the Bible happens on the new moon or the full moon when you understand his calendar. And uh, <clears throat> it says they set out from Rephidim and came to the wilderness of Sinai and they encamped in the wilderness. There Israel encamped before the mountain while Moses went up to God. So what do we see? Moses, he goes up to the mountain, right? How many of you have ever climbed Mount Rainier? Anybody ever climbed? Wow, I'm impressed, I'm amazed. Uh, I've climbed Mount Rainier about 10 feet and then came back down. Uh, I don't think how big this mountain was that he went up Mount Sinai, I don't know how big it was, but he, listen to this. He goes up, and then in the next verse here, Exodus 19, uh, verse 6, we see God is telling Moses, you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the children of Israel. And so he climbs all the way back down. If I was Moses, I'd have said, you told me about 60 seconds worth of material. Why didn't you tell me down here? You know, so he goes all the way up. Then he has to come all the way back down and look at Exodus 19, seven and eight. Moses came, he called for the elders of the people and laid before their faces all these words which the Lord had commanded him. And all the people answered together and said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. So now what did he do? He goes back up again. So he goes up and down, up and down, up and down. About 10 times when you read the story, you're going to see he's running up and down. The mo this is the very moment. Think about this. This is Shavuot, but this is the very moment that God has been waiting for for a couple thousand years. From the creation of Adam, now all the way to Mount Sinai, he's entering the world again. His presence in a special way. Here he was in the garden. Boom. People had to leave. He left. And now, for the first time in history since then, he's re-entering in a special way again into his world. And so um, this also is the marriage ceremony, okay? He's about to enter into a marriage covenant as well. This is the big day. How many of you want to have a big wedding and have everything right when you first got married? Well, this is God's wedding. He is being betrothed. He's not actually finishing the marriage. There's two parts of a wedding ceremony in Israel. And this is the engagement, the betrothal. Uh, and so uh, he wants to do it up big. And so what do we see here? <clears throat> uh, there's always the ketubah. 
The ketubah is the marriage certificate. Did they have a ketubah? Yes, it was the written commandments that God had given them. This is the marriage ceremony. They have, uh, the Torah is the ketubah. The marriage canopy was the chuppah of God's presence all over them. The heavens themselves are the ketubah. But God is determined to outdo himself. So he, what does he do? He strikes up the thunder. He causes the mountain to quake and he sets the mountaintop ablaze and enshrouds the mountaintop in thick smoke. So he wants a great, big, beautiful betrothal. Now, <clears throat> Exodus 19, verse 8 and 9, Moses returned the words of the people to the Lord. And the Lord said to Moses, Lo, I'm coming to you in a thick cloud that the people may hear when I speak to you and believe you forever. I think it's amazing. God said he's going to do all this that the people could hear Moses and believe Moses forever. And to this day, there are people who believe Moses. And to this day, there are people who want nothing to do with Moses or the law. And then Moses told the words of the people to the Lord. Let's look at Exodus 19, verse 10. Uh, before I go there, don't you think it's interesting that God would tell Moses that they would believe Moses forever? Why didn't God say that they may believe me? Think about that for a minute. Here he's, God is saying that the people may hear when I speak with you and believe me by the words I'm speaking. But no, God doesn't say that they can believe me. He wants everyone to believe Moses. Okay, that means that Moses hears from God and Moses is faithful and writes down exactly what God says. And so in Exodus 19, 10, the Lord said to Moses, go to the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow and let them wash their clothes. Do you know all throughout the Bible, God is telling people to wash their clothes, but it's like a parable. Okay, what is he meaning when he says they wash their clothes? They've got to get off the filthiness of the flesh and put on the garments of the spirit. Look at Revelation 3, 5. The one who overcomes is going to be what? Clothed in new garments. And this way, with white garments, I will not erase that person's name from the book of life. I will confess this individual's name before my father and before his angels. There's always a change of garments with God. We have to get away from the sins of the flesh. And he's going to give us nice garments. Look at Revelation 3, 17 and 18. He's speaking to the Laodicean church and he's, he says, you claim that you're rich and, and you prosper so much that you don't need anything. You do not recognize that in reality, you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I advise you to buy gold refined in the fire, which only comes from me so that you can become rich. Buy also white robes in order to clothe yourself so that your shameful state of nakedness will not be revealed. By eye staff as well to know what your eyes so you may be able to see. Again, he's not speaking to the unsaved. He's speaking to the church. And they need to be clothed in new garments. Look at Matthew 22. This is verse 9 through 13. It says, go therefore to the main roads, as many as you can find, and invite them to the wedding feast. And those servants went out into the streets and gathered together everyone they found, who? Both the evil and the good. Our job is not to sort. God's job is to sort. Our job is to bring them to the Lord, and then he will sort everything out. And the, but look at this. The wedding hall was filled with dinner guests, and when the king came in to look over the dinner guests, he noticed there was someone who wasn't wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, friend, how dare you come in here without a wedding robe? And the man kept quiet. That was smart. But then the king ordered his servants, bind him hand and foot, throw him into the outer darkness in that place where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. That is not hell. I believe this is a person that goes through the tribulation because they were trying to enter the wedding feast in their own righteousness. Think, see, back then the parable goes, basically the king, 
He had rich people in his kingdom and he had poor people in his kingdom. He's having a wedding for his son. He wants everyone to come, but he wants everyone to look nice. So he gives everyone a wedding garment in his kingdom and they're to come in the wedding garment he provided them. But this person wants to come in his own fine tuxedo suit because he's so proud of himself. And that's the one who gets to go to the tribulation because he didn't have on the wedding garment the righteousness that was put upon him from the Lord. They're trying to come to him in their own righteousness. This is why it's in Luke. It says when the uh, Messiah basically returns from the wedding, if you open immediately when he calls, then you'll get to come for the wedding feast. There's the wedding. Seven days later, the wedding feast. So some people are going to be going through the tribulation and the uh, Messiah is going to come. They weren't ready for the wedding, but they get ready during the tribulation. So he comes and they're invited to the wedding feast at the end. Now, look at this. All of this comes from Zephaniah 1, 7 and 8. It says, be silent at the presence of the Lord. And what was this guy in the gospels we just read? He stood there and he was what? Silent. And it says, for the day of the Lord is at hand. This is referring to the tribulation. The Lord's prepared a sacrifice. He's consecrated his guests. And it will happen in the day of the Lord's sacrifice. I will punish the princes and the king's own sons and all those who are clothed with foreign clothing. The king's own kids. There are many people in the church that claim to be the king's own kids, but they're coming in their own clothing, their own righteousness rather than in the righteousness that God provides them. Luke 12, 35 through 37. Here's the verse I was talking to you about. Just like the uh, foolish virgins, here's the foolish men. It says, stay dressed for action and keep your lamps burning and be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast so that they may open the door to him at once when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those servants whom the master finds awoke when he comes Truly I say to you, he will dress himself for service, have them recline at the table, and he will come and serve them. So these are people that don't make it to the wedding. They're going through the tribulation. But then at some point, what does he do? He comes, and if this time they're awake when he knocks, now they get to go to the wedding feast. And so look at Exodus 19.11. He says, be ready for the, which day? Okay. Because on the third day, the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people on Mount Sinai. What day? And a day with the Lord is how many years? And so what do we have? This has been 2,000 years since Messiah, and we're entering the third day. What year did Messiah die? 30 A.D. Okay, 2,000 years plus 30 is 2030, which means we're about to enter the third day when he will raise us up and we will live in his sight. Look at Hosea 6, 1 and 2. Come, let us return to the Lord. He is torn. He will heal us. He has stricken. He'll bind us up. After two days, he will bring us to life. And the third day, he'll raise us up and we'll live in his sight. It's right there in his scriptures. I, I think about this. Look how close we are. Look how close we are. First, he's got to die. That's what it says in Hosea, uh, right b uh, before this verse, in Hosea 5. And he says, I will go and return to my place. He did that in 30 AD. And then it says after two days, which is after 2000 years or 2030, the third day I will raise you up and you will live in my sight. That's the millennial reign. 2030 is the end of the second day. Okay. Look at Exodus 19, 12 through 15. You're to set bounds to the people saying, take heed to yourselves. Don't go up into the mountain. Don't even touch the border. Whoever touches the mountain is going to die. There shall not be a hand to touch it, but it will surely be who will not be stoned or shot through. Whether he's beast or man, it won't live. And when the trumpet sounded long, 
They come up to the mountain. And when does the trumpet sound long? On Rosh Hashanah, Yom Teruah. And it says Moses went down from the mountain to the people. He sanctified the people, washed their clothes and said to the people, be ready for what? The third day. And I'm telling you, we're about to enter the third day and it's time for you to be ready. Let's look at Exodus 19, 20. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai on the top of the mountain. The Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain and Moses went back up again. He's there for about two seconds and the Lord says, go back down. I, if I was Moses, I'd be frustrated. All the up and down, up and down. He says, command the people lest they break through to the Lord to gaze and many of them perish. And Moses said, the people can't come up to Mount Sinai. You command us saying, set bounce around the mountain, sanctify it. And the Lord said to him, get out of here. <laughs> go down and then you come back up again. Uh, take Aaron with you. But what this is doing, this is showing God's concern for the people. He loves the people. He doesn't want any of them to die. And so Exodus 19, 25, Moses goes back down to the people and spoke to them. And then in Exodus 20, verse 1 through 3, it says, And God spoke all these words, saying, I'm the Lord your God which have brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You'd have no other gods before me. Okay, it says God spoke all these what? Words, right? What does Matthew 12, 34 say? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. That means the commandments were coming from the abundance of God's heart. It was, the commandments are God's very heart, guys. That's amazing. They were heartfelt. This is why in Matthew 4, 4, when the devil's tempting him, he answered and said, look, it stands written, a person shall not live by bread alone, but rather on every word that comes from the mouth of God. How do you believe that? The Torah is from the mouth of God. The Torah is the only verse out of the, or is the only scripture out of the entire Old Testament that's directly from the mouth of God. All the other books beside the Torah were inspiration given to prophets. The Torah is the only thing that came from the mouth of God himself. Why would we say it's done away with? Okay, Exodus 34, 28. Moses was there with the Lord for 40 days and 40 nights. He didn't eat any bread or drink water. And he wrote upon the tables the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. Well, what's amazing here, the Ten Commandments doesn't exist. It's not the Ten Commandments. The Hebrew word for commandments is devarim. It's the Ten Words. Let's look at 1 John 5, 2 and 3. John says, by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey His commandments. A lot of people say, well, I don't obey the Father's commandments. I only obey the Son's commandments. <laughs> well, that isn't too smart. Uh, it says, this is the love of God when we obey his commandments and his commandments do not even seem like a burden. Wow, how come so much of the church sees all the commandments in the Tanakh as some horrible burden? I mean, man, you mean I can't steal? You mean I can't kill Joe over there? Oh, what a burden. Okay, but here's what's important. We follow what God says because we are his kids. Now, this is important. We do not follow God so we can become his kids. You don't obey God so you can become his kid. It's after you're his kid, then you obey his commandments. That's, I mean, that, that is heavy. You really have to think about that. Exodus 20, verse 6, it says God is speaking and he talks about how he shows mercy to thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Now, this time the Hebrew word isn't devarim, it's mitzvot. And the mitzvot means what the work he wants us to do. Now, here's what most Christians miss. It says he shows mercy to thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Well, now, wait a minute. 
does he have to show mercy if you keep his commandments? You don't show mercy to someone if you don't need to show mercy if you keep his commandments. That means believers are going to blow it. But if you're, there's a difference, there's like 10 different levels of sin. I have them downstairs on the, on a, as a handout, I think, but it's on our website. People need to understand there's different levels of sin. One of them is you're shooting at, let's say you're uh, an archer and you're shooting at the target. You might miss the bullseye. Okay, that's considered a sin. Missing the mark, that's what sin is, to miss the mark. You might miss the bullseye. Maybe you might try again and you miss the whole target. Okay, those are sins. But as you see the progression of sin, when it is the worst, you're not even facing the target. You're over here shooting off arrows. That's, a, that's raw, that's wicked. There's like 10 different Hebrew words for sin. And so it's a progression from here all the way to here and why God says we need to return back home and face this way, okay? So what he's saying is those of us who sinned, but we're at least aiming at the target, he shows mercy, okay? But he doesn't show mercy to those who aren't even facing the target. But many Christians seem to think, well, I've got Jesus in my pocket. I can rebel and run from God. And he says, oh, that's okay. You can do all these horrible, evil things. You know, you get your get out of hell free card. Uh, but that's not how it works. Okay. So mercy is never, mercy is never shown to those who continually disobey though and feel God's laws don't apply to them. Why would someone show mercy to someone who feels like the law doesn't apply? You'd be crazy. That's like someone coming before the judge. He's an arsonist, okay? And the judge says, I will show you mercy if you give me the matches in your hand. Oh, no, no, show me mercy, but I want to keep at least four more matches. I mean, that's just dumb. Okay, so Exodus 20, verse 8 through 11, he says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. You're to labor six days, do all your work. The seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord. Don't do any work. I don't want your son, your daughter, your male servant, your female servant. I don't even want your livestock or the stranger who's within your gates to be working. In six days, the Lord made the heaven and the earth, the sea and all that is in them and rested the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and he's the one who made it holy. Now you want to make a, you may want to make another day of the week holy. That's fine, but it's holy to you. It's not holy to him. <clears throat> okay. And then Exodus verse, chapter 20, verse 18 through 23. Before we go there, I want to go here. The word mitzvot. What does mitzvot mean? It comes from a word that means a team, to join. It's like here you have two kids joining together. They're a team. Okay, so here I have the mitzvot. Basically, God says, take my yoke upon you, right? So here's the yoke of God. Well, guess what? He's hooked up to the yoke, and then you're hooked up with him, and we're supposed to learn his ways. So what we find out, it's like God says, like a bicycle built for two. He says, I want you to do this, but guess what? I'm going to do all the pedaling. I'm in the front. I'm doing all the work. And that's why it's easy. He says, my yoke is easy. Why? Because he's the one who's pulling the load. You're just along for the ride. And then you get blessed for doing it. Now, it says God's Sabbaths. He says my Sabbaths. And it's not just Saturday. Uh, it's a feast of unleavened bread, Shavuot, Yom Teruah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot. He says, my Sabbaths, plural, which is, again, is referring to a lot more than just Saturday. He wants us to keep all of them. And so in Exodus 20, I got to go, uh, get going. Okay, 18 through 23, all the people perceived the thunder, lightning, the sound of the shofar, and the mountain was smoking. And when the people saw it, they were shaken in their boots. They stayed away and they said to Moses, speak with us yourself and we will listen, but don't let God speak with us lest we die. And Moses says, don't be afraid. God's come to test you that his fear may be before you that you won't sin. And the people stayed at a distance, but Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. And the Lord said to Moses, this is what you're to tell the children of Israel. You yourselves have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. You will most certainly not make alongside of me gods of silver or gods of gold 
for yourselves. So here we see the, this is where the 10 words are coming up here. But I think part of the problem with Judaism today, they're still listening just to Moses. They're not listening also to God. And that was their problem from the very beginning. They didn't want to hear from God. They wanted to hear from Moses only. Okay, we're going to close this up with the Haftor from Isaiah 6, 1 through 5. Here it says, In the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up. And then it says, Above him stood the seraphim. Each one had six wings. Two they covered their face, two their feet. Two, they were flying, and they're calling out to another, saying, Kadosh, Kadosh, Kadosh is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory, and the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And then I said, woe is me, I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Can you imagine what that will be like? Wow, crazy. Now, this is the uh, word for throne, but it's also the same word for full moon. Isn't that fascinating? Or no, actually, it's, uh, anyway, let me go on to Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. Look at this. I have it up on the screen. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, the prince of peace, and then it says, of the increase of his government and peace, there'll be no end. Well, let me show you something here. The word for increase in Hebrew is le mar be. All right? That's what I want you to look at the screen here. And notice at the bottom, I have a capital M and a small m. It's the same thing in Hebrew. They have different shaped letters. There's the uh, one M that is open at the bottom and the other mem that is closed. And the M, mem, represents water. And so what the sages have always said, an open mem refers to a woman who can have children. A closed mem is a woman who is barren and can't have kids. Okay, it represents water. And we know when the baby is born, the water breaks. Well, here's what's fascinating. You can only have a closed mem at the end of a word, if the mem is anywhere else in the word, just like we have a capital M at the beginning of a word, okay, at the beginning of a sentence as well, well, you can only have a closed mem at the end of a Hebrew word. Anywhere else, it has to be the open mem. And so here would be that word in the text is le mar be. You have to see the open mem there? But there's a problem. When they found the Dead Sea Scrolls and they found a scroll of Isaiah, it is written with a closed mem at the very beginning. And so what they say, oh, well, let me show you, here's the scrolls. You can see the word shalom and there's the closed mem. Here is the, uh, another one. Let me see. Oh, oh where is it? Uh, shalom. Oh, where is it? I'll have to go back and look. But here's the deal. Oh, oh. Lemore Bay. Now look at this. Oh, what do I got here? Oh, I'm on the wrong page. Where it says, unto us a child is born, and of the increase of his government and peace so be no end. The sages say, because of the closed man, they knew it would be a supernatural birth because it was a closed mem that was at the beginning of the word. With that, let's stand. We'll have a break and then we'll have some worship and then we'll come back and I'm gonna share with you something that is so totally mind blowing that I realized this morning. It's one of these things you already know, but then it's like, man, it, it hits you like a ton of bricks. So hold on. Avinu Malkenu, our Father King, we just thank you. We worship you. <sighs> Give us all seeing eyes, ears to hear, a heart to understand. Your word, your Torah is still alive because when you speak, your, your words go throughout all of eternity. We just pray, Lord, that uh, we would get a grasp of how important your words are, that we would turn to you and we would realize that all your commandments are because you love us 
number one. And number two, we're yoked up with you. You're the one who's carrying the load. And so we just want to rest in you. And Father, I thank you for so much for all of those who are around the world, around the United States, and those that are here that are listening into your word. I pray for everybody that's here and all those that are watching right now that you would bless them out of their socks. Father, that you would abundantly bless them. Father, and that with that blessing, they would build your kingdom, not their own kingdom. Your kingdom is about to come and your will is about to be done here on earth. There is no time to waste. So Father, I pray that everyone would be sowing good seeds into your kingdom. And we thank you for them in Yeshua's name. Amen. Together, blessed are you, Lord our God, creator and king of the universe. You have blessed us with your Torah of truth. You have blessed us with the whole counsel of your living word by the power of your Holy Spirit through the completed work of Messiah Yeshua. You alone have planted among us life eternal. Blessed are you, Lord our God. Amen. Take a break. Okay, as you know, we are digging deeper into the Gospels. I wanted to uh, bring some understanding uh, as we read the Gospels from a Hebraic perspective. So where we're going to start is with the concept of parables. What is a parable? Parables were common during the times of Yeshua, but people sometimes misunderstand a parable. A parable is not a riddle. It's not something that's hard to understand. A parable is an illustration to make it easier to understand the truths, not to make them harder to understand. Um, Some of the early church fathers thought that Yeshua was trying to hide his message by cleverly concealing truths. Rather, what he was doing He was making them easier to understand. But the thing about the parable, when they understood it, they had to react. You can't just not do anything with it. You you have to do something. Well, let's take a look at Matthew chapter 13, verse 34 and 35. It says, all of these things spoke Yeshua to the multitude in parables. And without a parable, did he not speak to them that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. In other words, those things that have been kept secret are now going to be made known through the parable or the illustration. Now, does anybody know where that came from when he says the prophet? What prophet? It comes from Psalms. And when you look at the Psalm, it was Asaph was the one. Uh, Look at this. Psalm 78, one through eight. It says, give ear, O my people, to my Torah. What are we supposed to hear and obey? Is Torah. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. Uh, The words of his mouth was Torah. He says, I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and we have known. Our fathers have told us we will not hide them from their children, showing to the generation to come. That's all wrong. That means the terminal generation. This is referring to us. The praises of the Lord, his strength, his wonderful works that he has done. He has established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law, a Torah in Israel, which he commanded our fathers, that they should make them known to their children that the generation to come, that's Acheron, that's us, that we might know the words of the Torah, he says. And then it says, even the children which should be born, who will arise and declare them to their children, that they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. And they won't be as their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that did not set their heart aright and whose spirit was not steadfast with God. So twice he says, here, listen. And look at Mark chapter four, verse nine and 10. 
Yeshua says to them, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Okay, he's talking about not just hearing, but hear and obey, hear and do. And uh, when he was alone, uh, his disciples, uh, 12 of them asked him, what is the meaning of this parable? And look how he responds at verse 13. He said to them, you don't know this parable? How then will you know any of the parables? So this is the foundational parable, and it's the parable of the sower and the seed. And we're going to look at that more in detail in a little bit. But look at Mark 4, 33 through 34. And with many such parables spoke he the word unto them as they were able to hear it. But without a parable, he did not speak to them. And when they were alone, he expounded all things to his disciples. So how many of us got the idea now that he spoke in parables? Okay. <laughs> Illustrations. Now, how many of you have ever been out on the ocean on a boat? Were there ever troublous waters? When you're out in the ocean sometimes and you see these big ships way up and crashing back down. Well, here we're going to look at the story on the Sea of Galilee when this big storm arose. And look at this. This is in Mark again. For where we just were, he's talking about parables. And then he jumps to this story. When they had sent away a multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship. Okay. I don't even know there are different sized boats. He is in the ship. And there are also with him other what? Little. little ships. There's a whole bunch of little ships and he's in a big ship. Right? At least bigger than the little ships. Some people miss this point. And there arose a great storm of wind and the waves were beating into the ship. So the waves are higher then the ship is tall and the waves are coming into this ship so that it was now full. Now, think about this. If he's in the big ship and the big ship is full, what's happened to all the little ships? <laughs> and the disciples are seeing all the little ships. Everyone's either drowning or trying to get to the shore. All right, so... And they see Yeshua's not doing anything for any of the little ships. And they're getting worried. And now their ship is full. But he was at the back of the boat asleep on a pillow. And they woke him up and they said to him, Master, do you not care that we perish? You obviously didn't care about them. Well, what about us? And it says, so he arose. And what did he do? He rebuked the wind. And he said unto the sea, peace. Be still. And look, all of a sudden, everything's calm. And it just went, went from a storm to instant quiet, instant peacefulness. And he said to them, what are you worried about? Don't you have any faith? And he says, why are you so fearful? And then it says they feared exceedingly. He made it worse. Now <laughs> they're really afraid. And they said one to another, what manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Wow. Wow. Well, the whole purpose of that was to let them know that he was the Lord. How do I know? Go to Psalm 107, verse 23 through 21, those that go down to the sea in ships that do business in great waters, they see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. He commands and he's the one who raises the stormy wind, which lifts up the waves. They're mounting up to heaven. They're going down again to the depths and their soul is melted because of the trouble. They reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man and are at their wits end. 
Then they cry to the Lord in their trouble. He brings them out of their distresses. He makes the storm a calm so that the waves thereof are still. Then are they glad because they're quiet. And so he brings them to their desired haven. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and his wonderful works to the children of men. Right there. They knew the Psalms. And also they realized, oh my goodness, this is the Lord. He's the one who does this. Now look at the gospel of John 21, verse 7 through 11. Therefore, that disciple whom Yeshua loved, John, said to Peter, it's the Lord. And now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt his fisher's coat for he didn't have any clothes on. And he cast himself into the sea and the other disciples came in a little ship. For they weren't far from land, but as it were about 200 cubits, dragging the net with fishes. And as soon as they came to land, they saw a fire of coals and fish laid there and bread. And Jesus said to them, bring of the fish which you have caught. And Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of great fishes, 153. There were so many, yet was the net not broken. Wow. Wow. Can you imagine all these fish that they got 153? Why did it say 153? What was the point? I can't hear you, Matthew. But why did he say specifically 153? Why not 152? Why even say how many? Why didn't he just say there was a whole bunch of fish and stop there? Why? What was the point of the number 153? Yeah? 153 nations? Yeah, I'm not sure. uh, Yeah, I'm not sure how many nations there are in the world. I know when they did the sacrifice, it was for 70 nations, but there could be 153. Oh, I think uh, the UN right now has over 200. So I'm not sure at what point, but guess why? It was 153. But wait, there's more. Here, I am the Lord your God. Ani, Yudhe Vavhe, Elohia Ka. Ka is your. I am your God. Well, every letter has a numerical value. The Kaf is 20, the Yud is 10, the He is 5, the Lamed is 30, the Aleph is 1, 5, 6, 5, 10, and 10, and 50, and 1. Guess what? When you add up, I'm the Lord, your God, you get 153. What he is telling them is I am the Lord, your God, just like doubting Thomas says. Wow, you are my Lord, my God. Now you're only going to get that in Hebrew. You're not going to get it in English. Okay. But I think this is so fascinating that they were all pretty much fishermen. That's what they did back then, okay? They were farmers or they were fishermen. That was the trade of the area. And how many of you know the fish is the symbol for Christianity? It's all about the fish. And in Exodus, when we begin, God said he was going to multiply Israel like fish, not rabbits. He said fish because we are considered fish. Okay, now look at Matthew. This is chapter four and verse 19. He said unto them, follow me and I will make you what? Fishers of men. So this is like a parable. Okay, they're to catch, they always are catching fish, but he says, I want you to catch people. Okay, so they're supposed to, Catch on. Oh, okay. We're supposed to catch people, not fish. Well, look at Jeremiah chapter 16, verse 16. This is where this comes from. Behold, I will send for many fishers, says the Lord, and they will do what? Fish them. So when he speaks to them about making them fishers of men, it's referring back to this very verse in Jeremiah 16, 16. But then he says, and after that, I will send for many hunters and they will hunt them from every mountain and every hill and out of the holes of the rocks. Okay, what's the point of that? Well, if you remember in Islam, 
they have this quote that even a rock will cry out, there's a Jew behind me, come and kill them. So God has been wanting to fish the Jewish people from all over the world back to Israel. And the ones that refuse to go, he's going to send the hunters, referring to Islam, who are going to hunt them and chase them back to Israel because he wants them all in Israel for the coming of the Messiah. Now, let's see where I'm at. Now, here's something that is mind-blowing. This is one of the things I wanted to share that really hit me today. I already talked about this. And you know how you can see something and read it, and then all of a sudden something will be revealed and something else will be revealed, and then all of a sudden the big light comes on? This isn't on your notes, but you can write these down. Numbers chapter 10, look at what it says. They first took their journey according to the commandment of the Lord by the hand of Moses. When is this? This is, they've, and they had the Passover in Egypt. They go to Mount Sinai. They camp at Mount Sinai for an entire year, right? After that year, God tells them to go take the promised land. He organizes them as an army and they march according to where they're sitting around the tabernacle. All the tribes on the east go and then the south and then the west and then the north. So he has to get them organized. And it says, in the first place went the standard of the camp of the children of Judah. According to their what? Armies. He's getting them ready to go to war. Every tribe is according to their armies because they're going to go on the attack. And over his host was Nakshon. Why was Nakshon the very, very first one? I mean, why was Judah first and why is Nakshon first as the leader? He was the first one to jump in the Red Sea to make it part. Okay, <clears throat> so I wanted you to know all of Numbers 10 is about going to war. Does everyone see that? Okay, now, look at the end of the chapter. And it came to pass when the ark set forward. Okay, they're marching. They're now on the move. It said, Moses would say, what would he say? Rise up, O Lord, and let your enemies be scattered. Let them that hate you flee before you. And then when it rested, he would say, return, O Lord, to the many thousands of Israel. Everyone see that? Here's something you never see in English. You only see in Hebrew. There are these two upside down letter noon. Many of the sages say this should be an entire book in itself. There actually should be six books of the Torah and the sixth book should be just this verse. Nowhere do you have two upside down noons. Okay, all right. Now, here's a couple of things. What they say is, by they, I, I'm not saying the Jewish people, they don't see it this way, but this is how the people that know the Torah and know the Messiah, what they look at it like this, is this. First off, what does the letter noon represent? What's its picture symbol? Fish, and what we've been talking about, fish. But they're backwards and upside down, which refers to dead fish. Right? Everybody get that? These are backwards. They're upside down. These are two dead fish. You know, like a parentheses, you put a sentence, you have parentheses around it. These are parentheses around this Torah portion, and it's dead fish. But because it says, rise up, O Lord, the dead fish here represents the resurrection of the Messiah when he rose from the dead. And then when it says, return, O Lord, this upside down fish refers to us being resurrected when the Lord returns. So this is actually talking about the army of the Lord in the end times being resurrected at the return of Messiah's coming. And they all have their banners, just like they did back then. Okay, now, I've been preaching that for a long time. That's nothing new. But 
The letter noon, what is the numerical value of the letter noon? No, the noon is not the number three. What is the numerical value of noon? All left through you is one through 10. And then it goes by 10s, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90. The noon is 50. 50. And 50 speaks of what year? Year of Jubilee. So, and I've taught that for a long time. Here we have these two brackets of dead fish representing the Messiah's resurrection and our resurrection. And it refers to the Jubilee. Here's what hit me. We just went through the last Jubilee from 1973 to 2023. That was the years of Jubilee. In 1973, there were two brackets. The first one, the Yom Kippur War happened on the first day of the year of Jubilee. And this last bracket happened at the very end of the Jubilee last October 7th, when Israel was attacked. So this verse is bracketed by wars. And I believe that means it is time for the resurrection of the dead. This just got done telling us. The army of the Lord, I believe, we're about to go to war. This is what my book is about. Uh, this is in my book. But here you have 50 and 50 you have the Yom Kippur War. You can only declare the year of Jubilee on Yom Kippur. And the year of Jubilee, the very first day of Yom Kippur in 73 was the Yom Kippur War. And now at the end of the Jubilee, it is bracketed by the Iron Sword War. So here, the first was talking about the resurrection of the Lord. And the second one is talking about our resurrection when we go up to meet the Messiah. I'm telling you, this is the generation. This is the time. Which is why I talk about the upside down noon in the book that I wrote. And I talk about this verse. This is why it is so important. The watchman has to warn people. Otherwise, it's on his own head. And I really believe this is from the Lord. And I want to warn people. This, every one of you, I believe, we're all going to see the return of the Messiah. And it, it, this is the generation. I'm not setting dates but I'm just telling you, all the patterns show it's coming down now. Now, with that said, let's move on. Okay, here's another example of a parable. Here is an old ancient coin you'll see up here uh, around the time of the Messiah, probably. But look at Matthew 22, verse 19 through 21. He says, show me the tribute money. And they brought unto him a penny. And he said to them, okay, who's the image in superscription? And they said, well, it's Caesar's. And he said to them, well, then give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, but give to God the things that belong to God. Okay, well, here's the thing. An earthly king stamps every one of the coins in his kingdom with his image. And so every coin looks exactly alike, but not so with God. He has stamped his image on every human being, and there's not a single human being who is exactly like another. His image goes on all of us. Another level of meaning is, whose image are you stamped with? Whose image are you stamped with? Who do you belong to? Do we belong to the world? Is that the image we're stamped with, or do we belong to the Lord? I'm going to tell you a story. <clears throat> there's a midrash or a little story of a, of a rabbi who was the son of a rabbi and he was coming from the house of his Torah teacher and he's riding leisurely on his donkey by the riverside and he was elated because he had studied so much Torah and he was very learned and then he passed by a peasant man who was walking by a day laborer who was exceedingly ugly and the peasant looked up with a smile and said, Shalom, Rabbi. But the rabbi responded, oh my, how ugly you are. Is everyone in your town this ugly? 
And the man replied, I don't know, but go and tell the craftsman who made me what an ugly vessel he has made. And the rabbi left off his donkey, prostrated himself on the ground before him and begged the man for forgiveness. Here we have the lofty scholar crossing paths with the one who doesn't know Torah, yet who had the greater wisdom? Matthew 13, 1 through 4. The same day, Yeshua left the house and he was sitting by the seaside. And great multitudes were gathered together to him so that he decided to go into a ship and he sat down. The whole multitude stood before him on the shore and he spoke many things unto them. How? In parables. And he said, behold, a sower went forth to sow. So here we go. We're going to look at the sower of the seed, and in this particular picture, it's on the stony ground. Matthew 13, 5 and 6, it says, Some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched because they had no root, they withered away. I've, I said this before. There is nothing new in the New Testament. Everything in the New Testament comes from the Old Testament. It just is expounding on them more because now they're understanding the Old Testament more. Look at this, Hosea 10, 12. Sow to yourselves, here's the, the guy sowing seed. And he says, sow to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy and break up your fallow ground for it's time to seek the Lord till he comes and rain righteousness upon you. See, this parable is coming from like from this verse. He's drawing from the Tanakh sharing things with them. Who does not know what fallow ground is? Okay, everyone know what fallow ground is. Like in the Shemitah year, they couldn't farm the land. So for an entire year, it wasn't tilled and it grew hard. So after the Shemitah year, when the land had to rest for a year, they had to break all that ground up again before they could sow the seed. If they didn't break it up, the seed's not going to do any good. And uh, let's look let me see, at Matthew 13, 7 through 9, he goes after the fallow ground. He says, some falls among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. But other fell into good ground and brought forth fruit, some 160, 30. Who, he, uh, who has ears to hear? Let him hear. Well, again, look at Jeremiah 4, 3. Thus says the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, break up your fallow ground and don't be sowing among the thorns. So this is, he's referring right back to the Tanakh, making it relevant to their day. As a matter of fact, Isaiah 55 is one of my favorite chapters. Look at verse six and seven. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Do you know what that means? That means there's times when you're not going to find him. If you have to seek the Lord when he can be found, that means you need to know the times when he can be. How many of you know, you know, in your family, sometimes dad would go to work. And you needed something from dad, you better ask him before he goes to work or when he gets back home. It's the same thing with the family of God. We need to know when we can get a hold of the Lord and when we can't. Oftentimes people call the office, is Pastor Mark there? No, he's not here. You know, call, you know, or come back at this time. It's the same thing with God. We have to seek him at the appointed time. We're to know when he can be found. And then it says, call upon him while he's near. Let the wicked forsake his way, the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return to the Lord. And then the Lord will have mercy on him. And to our God, he will abundantly pardon. But it goes on to say this, for as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven, and it doesn't return, but it waters the earth and it makes it bring forth and bud that it may give what? Seed to the sower. And we're reading about the parable of the seed and the sower and bread to the eater. Then he says, so shall my word be that goes out of my mouth. It will not return back to me void, but it will accomplish that which I please and it will prosper in the thing where I sent it. Do you know in Jewish thought, this verse describes the study of Torah. We know God's word is the seed, 
We know the Torah is likened to rain. The reason why the devil doesn't want you to pay attention to the Torah is because it is the seed from the word of God, literally, and it will bring forth fruit in your life. You can't produce a tree unless you plant a seed. You can't produce righteousness unless you get the seed of God planted in you. The problem is all through our lives, we're getting input from television. We're getting input from bad sources. And then we wonder why our fruit isn't what it should be. This is why we read the Torah. This is why we study the Torah. Unbeknownst to you, every time that you're here, seeds are being planted in you. And then all of a sudden, it could be a couple years later. I don't know. It could be sooner. You're going to start producing fruit because God says it's going to return to me and it won't be void. It'll have an impact. So we should be devouring, literally devouring the Torah at this time, trying to understand God's ways, God's heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Torah is the only thing that we've ever known that has come directly out of the mouth of God, that no one added to. That reminds me, who can tell me about how many different versions of the Bible are there in English? How many versions of the English Bible are there? Hundreds, if not a thousand. There's only one version in Hebrew. There can't be another version. They couldn't change one jot or one tittle. There's only one version in Hebrew and a thousand's in English. Why? Because the Hebrew is the only one that's correct. That hasn't been polluted. How many of you have heard of GMO? How many of you want to eat GMO foods? The problem with the English versions, they're GMO. You're reading GMO food. That's why there's so many different versions. This is why you want to have a, a New Testament that also has the Hebrew. Okay? And, and we do have some. Okay. But wait, there is more. But I have to wait. Okay. Now, here's what I want to say about the parable of the sower. That is really the wrong title from a Hebrew perspective. It should be called the parable of the hearers. The sower is the preacher. We know the seed is the word of God or Torah, but the parable is really about the four different types of people who receive the seed or hear the word with their responses and the resulting harvest or lack thereof. We have the wayside, the stony places, the thorns, the good ground. Really, it's a parable of four different types of people and how they respond when they hear. You know, uh, let's look at the Jewish background of this parable. First off, not everyone is familiar with the Jewish method of teaching that speaks about four types of disciples. There's always four types of disciples. In Jewish literature, they would always have these four types of people who study the Torah or study the Bible. Remember the story of the four Passover children? Every Passover, you have, uh, the, you have four cups. You have four types of children and how they respond to the Torah. You have unclean fish, clean fish, fish from the Jordan, and fish from the Mediterranean. Okay, there's, there's always four different types of fish as well. One of them is someone who studies, but they don't understand. Another one is one who studies and understands. Then there is a scholar who studies scripture. He understands, but he doesn't know how to debate effectively. Then there's a scholar who studies scripture. He understands and he can debate effectively. So when they hear this, they know it has to do with putting the Torah into practice. Understanding always comes with doing. So what Yeshua was doing was calling on the disciples to put his teachings into practice. One must hear and obey. Hearing alone is not enough. And so what do we find in Matthew 13, 13 through 16? Yeshua says, therefore, speak I to them in parables because they seeing, they don't see. And hearing, they don't hear. Neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which says, by hearing you will hear and shall not understand. And seeing you shall see, and you won't perceive. For the people's heart is wax gross, their ears are dull of hearing, their eyes they've closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart and should be converted and I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes for they see and your ears for they hear. 
Wow, where does that come from? Nothing new. It comes from Isaiah. Look at chapter 6, verse 9 and 10. And he said, go and tell this people, hear ye indeed, but don't understand. See indeed, but don't perceive. Make the heart of this people fat. Make their ears heavy. Shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their heart, and convert and be healed. What he's saying is this. You hear, but you don't get it. You see, but you don't get it. Both Isaiah and Yeshua wanted the listeners to be healed, but this would only happen if the people put the message into practice. Not everyone is willing to hear and obey. The parable of the hearers is a parable of the harvest. Those who hear and obey are the ones who produce much fruit. A lot of people come to church to hear, and then they go away and they don't remember anything that was said. And they, they didn't learn anything from this. Let's look at this. Last verse here, Matthew 13, 31, another parable put he forth to them saying, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a grain of mustard seed, which a man took, he sowed it in his field, which it is indeed the least of all the seeds. Okay, but when it is grown, it is the greatest among all herbs and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air can come and lodge in the branches. Here you go. Here's a picture of, of a herb garden of all different kinds of herb. But here's a man standing next to the mustard tree. It's really tall. He, that's like 10 foot tall. He's or six foot and here he is reaching his arm up and it goes higher than his arm. So the regular herbs say, you know, some can go pretty tall to the knee or to the waist, but the mustard seed is the smallest seed, but it grows really big and the parable is like unto faith. And like I said the other day, the disciples were asking the Lord for faith. And the Lord said, they said, increase our faith. And what did the Lord say? He said, if you have a grain of a mustard seed, you could do this and that. And in other words, he's saying, I don't need to increase your faith. You need to know how to operate the faith that you have. Romans 12 says, God gave you all of us a measure of faith. So we all have a mustard seed of faith. We don't need to increase it because that mustard seed size will remove mountains and trees. We just have to know how to operate it. And how do we operate it? Galatians 5, I think 13, it talks about faith, which works through love. How do we operate it? We have to become a humble, loving servant. And then our faith will grow because we're dependent on him. We're not dependent on ourselves. We're not dependent upon our own resources. The saddest thing about being rich is you tend to forget God and you don't rely on him. You're only relying on your own resources, uh, but we don't want to do that. So with that said, let's stand.